Yuma. 2020 has been a year like no other. It first started off with the city blanketed in a shroud of bushfire smoke. We then had a ferocious hailstorm, which smashed windows throughout the city. And finally, we're still living through the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. But through all of that, I've still been able to explore this wonderful city. So please enjoy the 2020 series of the Canberra series. After failing to win any gold medals at the 1976 Olympics in Montreal, the Australian government felt rather embarrassed that a sport-loving nation would do so poorly. So they decided to establish the Australian Institute of Sport. Its aim? To train and support elite athletes to succeed in their chosen field. The AAS was established on the 25th of January 1980, and the campus was opened by then Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser on Australia Day in 1981. Upon opening, the AIS specialised in basketball, gymnastics, netball, swimming, tennis, track and field, football and weightlifting. Today, the AIS has facilities for rugby and AFL, netball, volleyball, tennis, water polo and synchronised swimming, a combat centre, recovery centre and strength and conditioning gym. The AIS arena was originally called the National Indoor Sports Centre and has a capacity to seat 5,200 spectators. It was designed by Philip Cox and Partners. Originally, the AAS didn't have enough venues for training, and at times, five different sports would be sharing the indoor sports centre. Scattered around the AAS campus are sculptures depicting athletes in action, the largest of which are the basketballer and the gymnast. Built for the Sydney Olympics, they originally stood atop centre point tower. The sprinter was the third of the steel statues, but it lives in Sydney. 999, 1000. Curious about life at the AAS, but you don't want to train to be an elite athlete? Fortunately, you don't have to. You can go on a guided tour of the campus and have a go at the interactive exhibition Sportex. Or you could do some laps in the pool. After your tour, you could call into the shop and get some AIS gear, or if you felt like it, sit down and have a coffee at the cafe. The AIS is open between 8.30am and 5pm, Monday to Friday, and 10 to 4pm on weekends. For tour times and prices, be sure to check the website for details. If you've enjoyed this video, feel free to like, comment and share. If you want to see more, hit the subscribe button. The Enlightened Festival has its origins as an election promise from the ACT Labour Party in 2008 to create an event held in autumn. It wasn't until December 2010 that the Minister for Tourism and future Chief Minister, Andrew Barr, announced that the first Enlightened will be held over four days in March 2011, with a $5.3 million commitment over the next four years to establish Enlightened as an annual event. A first for the ACT, the National Gallery of Australia, Parliament House, the National Library of Australia and Old Parliament House all had their facades lit up with architectural projections, with the National Portrait Gallery and Questacon joining the illuminations in 2012. To draw people in, the ACT government invited In Excess to be a headline act for a ticketed concert during the festival. In its second year, Enlightened became a part of the Canberra Festival and had grown to include 35 events at 11 attractions. From underground geological tours of Parliament House to the screening of the Lights Canberra Action Film Festival. Jumping forward to 2015, Enlightened hosted the Night Noodle Markets for the first time, featuring 25 hawker-style food stalls showcasing food and wine from the Canberra region. In its first year, it attracted 155,000 people, all to the backdrop of the illuminated buildings and street performers and has remained popular ever since. Enlightened hasn't been free of controversy over the years. The festival has come under fire for not paying its artists, which was rectified from 2017 onwards. The projections have been designed by The Electric Canvas, an Australian company that specialises in architectural and large-scale projection. The company was established in 1997 and they have worked on Enlightened, Vivid in Sydney, the Commonwealth Games on the Gold Coast and the Sydney Olympics, among many other Australian and international events. 
The technical director of the Electric Canvas, Peter Milne, says that the National Library of Australia is his favourite building to work with. In 2020, the ACT government announced that all Enlightened Illuminations will be powered by 100% renewable energy as part of their commitment to make Canberra net carbon neutral by 2045. Enlighten is held during the first two weeks of March. Illuminations are free to view. If you'd like to see the full program, visit EnlightenCanberra.com. Enlighten is a great opportunity to get out into the autumn air and see Canberra in a new light. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to like, comment and share. And if you want to see more, hit the subscribe button. The National Film and Sound Archive, or the NFSA for short, has its origins in 1935 as the National Historical Film and Speaking Record Library as part of the National Library of Australia. By 1984, however, the National Film and Sound Archive had outgrown the National Library. So on the 3rd of October, the then Prime Minister Bob Hawke opened their new headquarters in the old Australian Institute of Anatomy building in Acton which, between 1931 to 1984, was home to the anatomy collection of Sir Colin Mackenzie, which included Farlap's heart and Ned Kelly's skull. Designed by Walter Hayward Morris, the building is often described as an Art Deco building, but is more in line with late 20th century stripped classical architecture. By 1999, the archive had grown so much that extensions were built. In June 2004, the building was entered into the Commonwealth Heritage List. The National Film and Sound Archive is a living archive of over 3 million items covering everything from movies, TV and radio, scripts, posters, oral histories, costumes, phonograph cylinders and wire recordings, just to name a few things. In September 2019, they announced the start of video game archival, with eight games being chosen spanning 40 years of Australian video game history. The NFSA is more than just an archive. They also act as a museum and host exhibitions regularly. In recent years, the National Film and Sound Archive have hosted the Heath Ledger, a Life and Pictures exhibition, the Dressmaker Costume exhibition, and my personal favourite, Game Masters, the exhibition. If exhibitions aren't your thing, then maybe you would like to check out the ARC Cinema. Built in August 2007, the state-of-the-art 250-seat cinema cost $2 million to build, with $250,000 being spent on projecting equipment that can play films of any format. Due to the building's heritage status, the cinema had to be built in a way that would not damage or alter the building. If you'd like to visit the National Film and Sound Archive, it is open between 10am and 4pm daily, except Christmas Day and New Year's Day. Entry is free, but exhibitions and screenings may have a fee. Check the website for details. With new items being added and restored every day, the National Film and Sound Archive will continue to be Australia's living archive for generations to come. And who knows, maybe even my content will end up in there one day. It is hard to imagine Canberra without Lake Burley Griffin, but it would not have been possible without Scrivener Dam. Scrivener Dam was named after Charles Robert Scrivener, the surveyor who recommended the site for Canberra. His detailed surveys of the region were used by Walter Burley Griffin and other architects when competing to design the future capital. Griffin's plan always featured an ornamental lake, but Scrivener, who was the director of Commonwealth Lands and Surveys at the time, disagreed with the design. Originally, the lake was to be a series of small basins of water connected by weirs, but Scrivener instead suggested a single lake impounded by a dam. In the end, Scrivener's suggestions were adopted and the dam was built on his chosen site. As with much of Canberra, two world wars and a Great Depression delayed construction of the lake and dam. Construction finally began in September 1960, and a drought at the time allowed it to be built faster than expected. The gates were closed three years later, on the 20th of September 1963, by Interior Minister Gordon Freeth. The closing of the gates took place 50 years after Lady Demon declared Canberra to be Australia's capital, and the road that travels over the dam is named in her honour. Traffic access is possible because the gates are operated from below. Scrivener Dam was designed primarily by the Commonwealth Department of Works, Major Development Division. The Snowy Mountain Hydroelectric Authority designed the Sluice Gates controlled outlet works and some aspects of the Spillway Flapgate supports. The Flapgates were designed, manufactured, erected and tested by West German firm Rheinstahl Union Bruckenbau in association with AE Goodwin Limited. It is made of 55,000 cubic metres of concrete which holds back the 1.2 billion litres of Lake Burley Griffin. 
The dam measures 33 metres tall, 319 metres wide, 19.7 metres thick and has five hydraulic fish belly flap gates measuring 30 and a half metres wide. The dam is designed to keep the water at 556 metres above sea level and it can withstand a once in a 5,000 year flood. While it is fairly common for some of the gates to be opened after heavy rains, all five gates have only ever been opened once in 1976 due to major flooding. The dam is ranked fifth out of the 25 dams with heritage listing in Australia is a national engineering landmark and is on the register of national estate. The dam is managed and maintained by the National Capital Authority on behalf of the Commonwealth of Australia. Unfortunately, Charles Scrivener never got to see the completion of the lake as he died in 1923 at the age of 67. But fortunately, his name will live on with the dam that creates the centerpiece of our nation's capital. If you've enjoyed this video, feel free to like, comment and share. And if you want to see more, hit the subscribe button. Australian National Botanic Gardens have their origins in 1933 when the Federal Capital Advisory Council approached the Minister of the Interior with the recommendation to build a botanic garden. Dr Bertram Dixon, head of the Division of Plant Industry at the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, the precursor to the CSIRO, with the assistance of Colin Bernard, spent a year researching botanical gardens from around the world. By the 3rd of September 1935, the Dixon Report was ready. The report suggested the garden be situated at the lower slopes of Black Mountain, with space for gardens, an aviary, stables for horses if needed for yard work, and a staff of 59, to the cost of £12,000 per year, or roughly $1.1 million today. Dixon saw the scientific potential and chose the site based on its proximity to the proposed CSIR and university sites. However, it wasn't until three weeks after World War II when Lindsay Pryor sought £1,000 or roughly $73,000 today, to start the botanic gardens by planting a bunch of eucalyptus trees. The first trees were planted on the 12th of September 1949, including this eucalyptus tree which was planted by the director of the Royal Botanic Gardens in Kew, Sir Edward Salisbury, in the presence of then Prime Minister Ben Chifley. Public access was granted in 1967, but the gardens weren't officially opened until the 20th of October 1970 by then Prime Minister John Gorton, with Dr Bertram Dixon, responsible for the Dixon Report in 1935, in attendance. The gardens grew into quite a tourist attraction, and by 1970 they had installed a misting system to create Forest Gully. And in 1985 the visitor centre was opened by Prince Charles and Princess Diana. The National Botanic Gardens are home to more than just plants. You'll also find water dragons, the occasional blue tongue lizard, and a few other creatures if you look hard enough. About one fifth of all of Australia's flora is scattered across this 35 hectare garden, or about 4,300 species. This makes it the most Australian garden in the world. The National Botanic Gardens are more than just a garden. They are also a seed bank, housing over 5,500 individual seed collections. The seed bank has become increasingly important due to climate change and the human impact on the environment. The seed bank functions to conserve, research, propagate and supply seeds of Australian flora. The seeds are collected from the wild and set up within the gardens as there is a high chance of hybridisation due to the proximity of similar plants to each other. For the plants that need a tropical environment, the gardens have a set of glass houses that simulate a tropical environment. The most recent addition to the gardens was the Red Centre Garden which cost $2 million and was opened on the 31st of October 2013. If walking around the gardens all day isn't your thing, then maybe you might like to try a spa treatment at the Jindy Spa, or to sit down and have a coffee at the Pollen Cafe. The Australian Botanic Gardens are open every day except Christmas Day from 8.30am to 5.30pm. The Visitor Centre and Bookshop are open every day except Christmas Day, 9.30am to 4.30pm. The Pollen Cafe is open every day, closed also on Christmas Day, between 9am and 2.30pm. It is free to enter, but there is paid parking at $3.50 an hour. The Australian National Botanical Gardens had humble beginnings as a report in the 1930s and have now grown into a national botanical institution for all Australians to enjoy. If you've enjoyed this video, feel free to like, comment and share. And if you want to see more, hit the subscribe button.
On the 12th of March 1963, then Prime Minister Robert Menzies read a message from Harold Macmillan, the British Prime Minister, offering a gift of either a bell tower or fountains to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Canberra being founded as the nation's capital. Ultimately, the Cabinet chose a Carillion and Bell Tower on Aspen Island. This distinction is important as a Carillion is an instrument that consists of at least 23 bells that are housed within the Bell Tower. The National Carillion has 57 bells, making it a Grand Carillion and the largest Carillion in the Southern Hemisphere. Today, the entire structure is known as the National Carillion. A design competition was held between 1967 and 68 between six architecture firms, three nominated by the Royal Institute of British Architects and the other three by the Royal Australian Institute of Architects. Each entrant was given £750 and a further £1,000 if they won. They were also expected to visit the site as well, with the cost being reimbursed. The winners were the Western Australian firm Cameron, Chisholm and Nickel. Their design was symbolic and modern and was located well to reflect off the lake. The design was made up of three triangle columns, representing the British and Australian governments and Canberra, the tallest of which is 50 metres tall. The idea of the design came from playing around with toddler and boxes. Construction began on the 15th of August 1969, when the Governor-General Sir Paul Haslock unveiled the foundation stone. Due to the size of some of the larger bells, the Carillion was designed to have a space in the centre of the clavier room and bell chamber to allow them to be hoisted into position. The bells were cast by John Taylor and Company of Lowborough, England, the same foundry that supplied the bells for the Bathurst War Memorial Carillion and the University of Sydney War Memorial Carillion. The largest of the bells is also the largest bell in Australia. It is inscribed, presented by Britain to the city of Canberra in commemoration of the Golden Jubilee of the founding of the national capital of Australia, 12th of March, 1963. Thanks to a speedy and efficient construction process, the National Carillion was completed in early 1970, just in time for Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II to open the Carillion on the 26th of April 1970. Recitals happen on a regular basis, including a Star Wars themed recital on May 4th. But the inaugural recital was performed in front of the Queen and Prince Philip by John Douglas Gordon. John was originally the Carillionist for the Sydney University Carillion and was influential in the development of the National Carillion. Between 1970 and 1988, he performed about 350 recitals. And on the 26th of April, 1995, the Aspen Island Bridge was renamed to the John Gordon Walk. To mark the passing of time, there is an automatic mechanism that chimes at each quarter of the hour between 8am and 11pm. Upon the hour, the Westminster chime is played, further strengthening the ties between Australia and the UK. When the clavier is played, the bells are struck from the inside, but when the Westminster chime is played, they are struck from the outside. How we pronounce Carillion is interesting as well. In English-speaking countries, Carillions weren't really a thing, preferring ropes instead of a clavier to chime bells. So the English language doesn't really have an anglicised word for it. The word has origins in French from the word quadrillion, meaning four bells. The Dutch and Belgians, on the other hand, the people who invented and perfected Carillions, pronounce it how we do. In 2020, the Carillion received operational upgrades. Two new bells were installed, the clappers were replaced, and the wires connecting the bells to the clavier were upgraded. The larger of the two bells installed is called the Nunnawal Bell. It was welcomed to country by Nunnawal elders on the 7th of February 2020. Inscribed on the bell is a welcome to country in both Nunnawal and English. So whenever it rings, it will extend a welcome to everyone in the capital from the original custodians. 50 years on, the National Carillion still rings true for all Canberrans. If you've enjoyed this video, feel free to like, comment and share. And if you want to see more, hit the subscribe button. Oh, if that was 2020, I wonder what 2021 is going to be like.